in a darkened theater, visual images from Hollywood flicker before our eyes. But take away the sounds that accompany those moving images, and you steal the thunder from every magical frame. Welcome to the little-known, occasionally noisy world of sound effects specialists. It's their job to create the audio that accompanies motion pictures. Often that means constructing every sound from the ground up. Coming up... Play it back, please. We'll go behind the microphone of Blake Edwards' Son of the Pink Panther, as experts in audio create the sounds of the Casbah. We'll also journey back to the dawn of sound effects with this legendary ape. And we'll meet the innovator who coined the term sound design for his work on Apocalypse Now. Today, we salute the sultans of sound on Movie Magic. Shooting is winding down on the set of Son of the Pink Panther. Until now, the focus of the production team has been to capture images on film. Sounds are captured too, but often the quality of the audio doesn't match the picture. As literally thousands of feet of film are edited into their final scenes, the immense challenge of refining, replacing, and often creating the soundtracks, fall on the shoulders of the sound design team. We've become known as the fixing it in post people. We can redo the dialogue, we can do the effects, we can do almost anything. What your job basically is, is to make it all seem like it's all really happening at that time. Supervising sound editor on Son of the Pink Panther, Kay Rose has been a respected member of Hollywood's film community for nearly 50 years. Kay was the first woman to receive the Academy Award for Sound Effects Editing for her work on the 1984 release, The River. Her other films include Ordinary People, The Prince of Tides, and On Golden Pond. As supervising sound editor, Kay is responsible for the overall audio design and a staff of 30 that brings those sounds to the big screen. Okay. Okay. That's easy. One of those highly specialized individuals is sound effects editor Mark Mangini. Mark and his company Weddington Productions are responsible for creating, designing, and editing the sound effects on Son of the Pink Panther. Tight quarters, huh? If you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, Star Trek 1, 4, or 5, Inner Space, or Aladdin, then you've heard Mark Mangini's award-winning work. That's pretty good, so we like that. Most people may not know that the microphone that's there on the set as they're filming isn't picking up all the sounds that you hear when you're in the theater when you see the finished product. Although that's certainly the sound editor's job is to create that illusion. So we will analyze the soundtrack for what's missing and determine how to best finish it. 313. Scene number 313 is Omar's Cafe. Okay, I've now set up a scene, and I'm now, uh, in sequential order, I'm going to decide what sounds we need to put in this scene. Once we've run the picture, we create a list. From that list, we begin to delegate responsibility, and we compartmentalize sound. There's what we call foley, which is the recording of footsteps and incidental props and movement. ADR and Walla, which is the re-recording of dialogue and group ambiences, if you will, or crowd sounds uh, specific to the picture that we don't have. Then there will be sound effects, you know, the very obvious ones being things like gunshots and door closes and car skids and things like that. We, those sounds always need to be augmented. I do the waiter. I could do them both, really, because the other guy's just going... Dialogue is the basis of any film. 
ADR, or Automated Dialogue Replacement, is the process for correcting or improving it. For this raucous scene in the Casbah, Dialogue Supervisor Vicki Sampson directs voice artists in an ADR, or looping, session. Here on a dubbing stage at Warner Hollywood Studios, 14 people recreate the background noise of dozens of revelers. A lot of ADR is uh, group looping, which is done with the characters in the background of a scene that are instructed on the set not to speak so that they can have clean tracks for their main actors. I'm going to kill you. Here, Vicky is using group ADR to add authenticity to exotic locales. In the Casbah scene in Pink Panther, they're in, in Lugash, so it's an imaginary city. So we had uh, a couple of Arabic-speaking men, uh, a couple of French-speaking women, and then we had uh, like four others who could replicate arabic -ese. And once it's all thrown in there together, it can sound like it was supposed to sound. ADR is also frequently used for individual dialogue replacement. It's not uncommon to re-record every word a character says. Dark women with blue eyes and full red lips who smell like night blooming jasmine and taste like a warm mango. <laughs> Wormy mango. Warm mango. I should make, I should be saying worm. worm. That's what I should do, don't you think? Oh worm mango, yes, <laughs> we gotta do one. Sometimes a director wants no. to change performance of an actor. Sometimes they want to revoice, use a whole different voice than the original actor. Yeah, it's weird when you play them all back together and see a flow of things. And taste like a worm. Mango. <laughs> worm. 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 Mango. Yes. <laughs> we looped the Deborah Parentino scene because in the uh, when they did that take, his voice was so projected and hers was so soft that the director was concerned that the balances would be off. Here we go. Take fourteen X seven oh three. Here we go, Tom. Worm. Mango. Is that a sync on that? Looping is a very hard phase of this, of the sound process because you're trying to recreate a performance that was done to other actors, on a on a bare stage with a headphones on with beeps coming at you and and you have to watch your mouth and a lot of actors haven't seen themselves before on the screen. Worm mango. Why don't you print them both and I'll just play with them. Okay. Yeah. It's like putting together a big puzzle and snipping out the little pieces you don't want and putting in the, the pieces that you don't notice. And uh, it's a very unrecognized phase of sound work because if you do it well, you don't notice it. And you shouldn't notice it. It should just be as if that was the way it was recorded on the set. Who smell like night blooming jasmine and taste like a warm mango. Warm? Mango? And honey. Dialogue replacement allows audiences to hear the actors as clearly as they see them. But some of the most involved wizardry of the audio process begins when the actors stop talking. When King Kong was released in 1933, feature-length talking pictures had only been around for six years. Yet this groundbreaking fantasy epic virtually wrote the book on sound effects. The audio work was staggering centered around the make-believe Kong and primeval beasts. All of these sounds had to be made from scratch, a daunting task that rested on the shoulders of RKO's new head of sound effects, Murray Spivak. I was very happy with the way King Kong turned out because it was a tremendous challenge, and I hadn't the slightest idea what I was going to do with it. What made Murray's work on King Kong possible was the development of re-recording technology. Prior to that time, they had to record the sound live. I had to make all of these sounds uh, simultaneously when they were shooting a picture. We only had one soundtrack, 
and all the sound had to be done at the same time. By the time King Kong was in production, Murray had access to portable audio machines that recorded sound on film. Having the freedom to take these devices into the field, pre-record a roaring lion, then re-record it at the studio while altering its pitch, allowed Murray to create King Kong's ferocious growl. I found that if I lowered a octave, it would be at half speed. Then I took a tiger roar, and then I put that backwards against the lion roar. You couldn't uh, detect what it was, and we knew it, there was no bass singer that could sing that low, so I knew that I was on the right track. Following Murray Spivak's inspired work, sound re-recording and synchronization techniques continued to evolve. Today, just as dialogue is re-recorded or altered, footsteps, breaking glass, even a belly dancer's rattling chains can be reproduced and manipulated through a technique called Foley. A Foley stage is a recording studio outfitted specifically to record hundreds of movie sounds in a controlled environment with close-up microphones. Even if a noise recorded on the set is adequate, it can usually be improved. It started out with mainly replacing footsteps or adding a few specific props here and there, maybe a crash or something like that. Now, like, you virtually replace or re-record nearly every single sound in the movie. Uh, we'll sweeten the table crashes there on Channel 15. Foley supervisor Chris Flick collaborates with Foley artists Ellen Hewer and Kevin Bartnoff to come up with more than two dozen different sounds for the Casbah scene alone. Why don't you, you stay, with, do? stay with the cloth that he'll put around the guy's neck, okay. and I'll stay with his hood. Okay. It's a lot easier to record it on the Foley stage because the Foley artists or Foley walkers can actually perform the prop movements right along with the actor or actress on the screen. Close. For one take. <laughs> yeah. Hey, go back here. We sweeten that. Should we add some glass breaks? I'm in the light there. Yeah, some glass breaks would be good. Okay. Some of the things we specifically wanted to highlight were the sort of the domino effect of of Clouseau Jr. cascading into everybody at the bar and all the tumbling and body falls. All of the plates that were on the tables and all the drinks and all the different sounds that could be created that way that would help help the humor of the scene. I mean, the, the scene is, is funny to begin with. It has that sort of slapstick, broad humor. And then the sound effects can really enhance it by, by punching up certain impacts and, and highlights of that. While Foley can recreate thousands of highly specialized sounds in the confines of a stage, audio designers must often venture far and wide to capture the sounds they need. I said stop! This scene calls for a wheezing diesel Renault. Sound technician Ezra Dweck is recreating that noise on a stage of somewhat bigger proportions, the Southern California desert. What I'm recording here, this interior stuff, will sort of be used to smooth out the interior car shots. A lot of times on the set, I think we've lost the cars are being towed along with the camera car anyway, so there is no yeah. engine sound. Ezra's recording of this Jetta doubling as the Renault in Pink Panther includes interiors, exteriors, practically every sound an automobile can make. Accelerate. Maybe downshift and hit the accelerator when you go by. Okay. Something to spice it up and make it a little more interesting. The main concern on the set isn't always to get the best sound effects because they know that they can send someone like me out later to do it. I dare say that's the best one yet. Some sounds can be recorded on an indoor stage and some under the blazing desert sun. 
but a good deal of cinema sound effects are designed on computer by the sound effects editor. That's better. Director Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now is one of the most controversial films of all time. On screen, the graphic portrayal of the chaos of the Vietnam War was enhanced immeasurably by its Academy Award winning soundtrack. I think that our arc life can be more interesting. I wish there was a little more we could get out of the, the, guy, the helicopter in the sky with the guys hanging on it. Just to, so that the audience can say, oh, you hear that? That means they're being nice to them. With Apocalypse Now, what audiences hear affects them as much as what they see. This accomplishment is due in large part to Walter Murch's breakthrough multi-channel audio. Um, update from 155. With his layering of seemingly surrealistic sounds, Murch elevated sound editing to the level of an art form. Along with making it visually spectacular, Francis wanted to make it sonically spectacular uh, on two levels technically to do something that hadn't been done before and then artistically to try to do something that hadn't been done before. The technical part of it was to turn the film into a quadraphonic setup so that we could move any sound across the whole 360 degrees of the space of the room. Artistically, we wanted to do a soundtrack that was in keeping with the sound of the war. Coppola's concern for realism inspired him to ship the patrol boat used in filming from the Philippines to his California ranch for a Foley session. Okay, now. Okay. Basically, we made the, the world into a Foley stage. As a result, we got dynamics and movement uh, and reality to the sound that's sometimes hard to get in the confines of a small stage. Walter's experience on Apocalypse Now inspired him to coin the term sound designer to describe his role on the film. And I thought it was sort of like a, a sonic equivalent of interior design in the sense that I'd been given a bare space to work with, a, a room with four walls, a ceiling and a floor, and I was told to hang sound, fill this place up with sound. The audio advances of Walter Murch and his contemporaries in the 70s have been furthered by modern use of digital technology. Computers aid in quicker, easier, and more complex manipulation of sound effects. Let's go to the first sound for the nose, which... At this point nose, in The Son of the Pink right, Panther, that which can't be spoken by an actor or recorded on a Foley stage must be created by Mark Mangini. When the belly dancer pops his nose off, I mean, that's a comic moment. So you just don't want a clay sound, you want like a... or, a, you know, some pop, so comic, cartoony-like sound, so we'll have to create that. What I pulled was 1356-56, which is some sort of burbly, liquidy face flatulation. That's the one. In electronic media, like a digital workstation, you have that sound, but now you have other tools online in the editing system that will allow you to slow it down, speed it up, play it backwards, manipulate the sound to more accurately complement a picture. Okay, well, that's good. They have some choices. What? With all of the necessary sound elements placed into the show, the last step is the final mix. This task falls to supervising sound editor Kay Rose and her three re-recording mixers. Hundreds of elements are mixed down into three elements, music, effects, and dialogue. And then they are balanced one against the other to make a track that's played in the theater. Yeah, I think we can get far better balances than what we've had before. Yeah. Okay. And make it more exciting, because that's that's the we'll, thing that carries. We won't, er, we won't erase anything, though. We can just we can just manufacture a new crowd. As long as we can make it, we'll make it better. Better than it is. Yeah. Right. We'll make it better. By carefully combining thousands of different sounds, Kay and her team take an essentially soundless piece of film and create a seamless movie. This is the Casbah scene as it was first recorded on location. And action. 
Now adding in group ADR. Oh. Foley. Effects. With the addition of the musical score, the audio work is complete. When audiences worldwide see the son of the Pink Panther, few people will consciously recognize the contribution of nearly 30 people and the culmination of thousands of hours of painstaking work. But that's the best testimony to the efforts of Mark Mangini, Kay Rose, and the entire sound team. If you are brought out of the film and you're aware that you're sitting in the theater watching a movie, then you failed. The most important thing to me is that the audience comes out feeling very happy they saw the picture and say, boy, that was a good two hours I spent and I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Sound designers are proud of their unheralded contributions to Hollywood filmmaking. When the picture begins and the sound fades up, it may not be immediately obvious, but the audience is listening, and what they're hearing is movie magic.